While the number of smokers in the UK has fallen by nearly a fifth over the last five years, the number who vape is at an all-time high, and it's a trend that's not been lost on the big cigarette manufacturers. British American Tobacco, Philip Morris, and Imperial Tobacco all now produce e-cigs of one type or another. But while the falling smoking rate is exciting public health experts, the burgeoning growth of vaping has divided them. So what's responsible for the split? Marcus Manafo is Professor of Biological Psychology at the University of Bristol. Well, a few years ago, e-cigarettes came onto the market and really took everyone by surprise in terms of how rapidly they grew in popularity and how many people were using them. And it brought to light this difference of opinion, essentially, in terms of two broad positions that different people hold. Either that e-cigarettes are generally a good thing, they help people to stop smoking, they're substantially less harmful than tobacco products, and therefore they can reduce the harms associated with tobacco use or that they're broadly a bad thing because they're another addictive product which could act as a gateway to tobacco use and could allow the tobacco industry to reinvent itself and continue marketing addictive products to the general population across the world. And what determines which group experts sit in? Well, this is the really interesting thing because, of course, all of these people have access to the same evidence, the same data. So it's really a matter of how we interpret that evidence. And the thing that I think people sometimes lose sight of is that although scientists are meant to be impartial, disinterested and so on, the reality of course is that scientists are human too and therefore subject to the same kinds of biases in their thinking that all of us are. Now our training is meant to protect us against that but it can only go so far. And people can find it difficult to admit that they were wrong or to change their position on something. It's very rare that we have an argument with someone and at the end of that argument the other person says oh, you were right all this time, I'm so glad you've pointed that out to me. It's, it's just not how people think, and scientists are the same. They tend to hold positions and find it difficult to shift those positions because they're human. So, to some extent, what it boils down to are just our feelings about the core issues, which are really not about evidence so much as our perspective on whether or not, for example being addicted to nicotine or using nicotine in the absence of other substantial harms is problematic in itself. And so it becomes, at some level, about values as much as it does about evidence. What about people's roles? I can imagine, for instance, if you're a clinician and you're working at the coalface dealing with smokers, that you might see cigarettes as a good thing, as a tool to get them off. Whereas if perhaps if you're at the research end of public health, you're more worried about perhaps new people coming into nicotine addiction through vaping. I think there's something in that. I don't know of any systematic attempt to survey that, if you like, but my sense is that you do get some people who have spent their careers, for example, trying to push back against the tobacco industry's attempts to prevent tobacco control legislation being implemented and so on, and they see the tobacco industry as the problem, if you like, and therefore the thing that they need to counter. And because the tobacco industry has been buying up some e-cigarette companies, they treat the two as related, if you like, and they see e-cigarettes as some kind of perhaps Trojan horse for the tobacco industry to reintroduce itself into mainstream debate around you know, what's acceptable in society. On the other hand, you have some people who have worked with smokers directly, helping them to stop smoking, and they see the benefit of e-cigarettes in helping those people to stop smoking. So I think personal experiences and the perspective that that provides one with can be part of this. So what you're saying is that these two groups might look at exactly the same data. Indeed, they are looking at exactly the same data, but they're, they're using it to confirm their own belief. It's a sort of vested academic interest. It is, but I think it's worth pointing out that these aren't necessarily conscious processes. So they're not actively going into a data set necessarily and saying, how can I draw conclusions from this that support my agenda, if you like, or my preconceptions? It's much more subtle than that and much more unconscious than that. I mean, financial vested interests, financial conflicts of interest are well known in the biomedical literature to be problematic. And so we have to disclose those now in, in the research that we do, in the publications that we write and so on, and rightly so. But these cognitive conflicts of interest, these cognitive biases, are much more difficult to tackle because they're less obvious. We're not even necessarily ourselves aware of the biases that we're bringing to our interpretation. And they're harder to make explicit, they're harder to write down because of that. Marcus, why does this matter? Because surely it's a good thing if we've got two opposing groups looking at the same data and that, that whatever 
you know, plan forward comes out of it, it'll be a sort of combination of the two. Is it not a better plan of action as a result of that compromise? I think that would be the case if there was evidence that the two sides were really engaged in a healthy debate trying to get to the heart of the matter, if you like. Now, there are obviously many people who are trying to do that, but there's an extent to which I think the debate has become so polarised that we've lost that middle ground. And it does matter because we need to understand whether or not, for example, there are any unintended consequences of allowing e-cigarettes onto the market. One of the concerns, which is a justifiable concern, is that young people will get their hands on electronic cigarettes and may start using those, and that that could serve as a gateway to then using tobacco products, cigarettes, which are dramatically more harmful. And if that's happening, then we might be negating any benefits of e-cigarettes helping people to stop smoking because they're also encouraging young people to start smoking. Now, the problem is that the evidence for a link between vaping and smoking amongst young people is all observational. It's correlational, which means that we can't confidently claim that there's a cause and effect relationship. But what you're seeing is that across this divide, on the one side, you have those who are interpreting these correlational data as implying a cause and effect relationship and therefore indicating that we should be concerned about that pathway from vaping to smoking. And on the other side, others interpreting the same data as not necessarily reflecting that because there could be other factors contributing to that correlation, like the fact that young people who are inclined to try things are going to try e-cigarettes and going to try cigarettes, but that doesn't mean that the two are causally connected, if you like. And understanding that is really important for informing public policy. But to reach that middle ground that you mentioned, that balanced position, does require healthy debate where we genuinely engage with the nuances around these arguments and accept the possibility that we might be wrong. And when you bring very strong feelings to those uh, discussions, it can be difficult to move your position. Professor Marcus Manafo.